A failure caused by the Canterbury earthquakes has been delivered to the Governor General today. Uh, I just want to briefly outline the process from here. The interim report will then be given to the Attorney General and Ministers will be considering the report later this afternoon. A public release of the report will take place on Wednesday. I obviously haven't uh, yet had an opportunity to read the interim report but I intend to take a look at it. The Government will not uh, have ready a full response to the report on Wednesday, uh, but we will be taking a very close look at the report and we look forward to the full report of the Commission, which is due early next year. In terms of ministerial activity, in terms of my activity this week, uh, tomorrow I'm in Hamilton, uh, on Wednesday I'm in Kaurau and Tapuki, on Thursday I'm in West Auckland, on Friday I'm back in Tauranga. Uh, finally, in relation to the Australian flag, you may have noticed behind me an Australian flag alongside the New Zealand flag here today. This afternoon I'm honouring a bet I had with Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard on the NRL Grand Final, which I unfortunately lost. Um, as a result of the Warriors' loss to Manly and Sydney, I have to display the Australian flag alongside the New Zealand flag, uh, and so today I'll be making good on that promise. I would add one thing, however, in no way does this indicate my support for the Wallabies this weekend uh, in the big semi-final against the All Blacks, and Julia Gillard and I have another bet on the Rugby World Cup, which you'll recall is the loser has eaten an apple. Uh, from the winner's country and speak effusively about its virtues. Um, I look forward to seeing the Australian Prime Minister biting into a delicious, juicy New Zealand very soon. Prime Minister, on the standard laws issue, the uh, statement you made to the House, do you now admit maybe that you've gone too far? No. Um, so let me run through a few things for you. Uh, on the way out, you're more than happy to get it. On the 6th of September, I released an email. I received an email. We'll have happy to release the email to you. Um, let me read the email for you. It says, Hi John, I was part of a session with a range of economists uh, yesterday morning. Every year they do this session with economists from Australia plus all the main New Zealand banks. And this year too from Standard & Poor's, including the guys who obviously have a lot to do with New Zealand's grading. Uh, anyway, the S&P guys were very complimentary about how the New Zealand government is uh, managing fiscally and they trust that what you say will happen happens and your unwavering commitment to getting New Zealand's balance sheet sorted for the long term. But there was one liner, uh, one one liner that I thought you could use. S and P said that there was a one third chance that New Zealand would get downgraded, and a two thirds chance it would not. And the inference was clear that it would be the other way around if Labor were in power. Uh, they discussed the impact on interest rates if New Zealand got downgraded, and how they would quickly impact on the homeowner mortgage market. So near near, there was much higher risk to New Zealanders that they will face higher interest rates under a Labor government. Don't know how you could use this, but it uh, looks quite serious to me. The person is known to me, they're known to be very trustworthy. I rang the person, had a conversation with them, and it was related exactly as I relayed it in the House, in case you forget or forgot. My exact comments in the House were uh, in relation to something I said to Phil Cobb. We will say this the standing force was uh, giving a meeting in New Zealand about a month ago. Uh, what it did say was there was about a 30% chance that we would be downgraded. That is what happens when one is on negative outlook. But did go on to say though that there, if there was a change of government, that uh, downgrade would be much more likely. But, but you said you said that there was an inference, though, wasn't it? Was an inference from an unnamed person. Well, the person's not unnamed. I know the person I rang. But there's so a who difference between an inference and standing on board saying it. So well, I have a conversation with the person on the phone. So, I'm but so the, the person's not from standard and pause, though, is it? No, it's not from standard. So, so who is the person? No, I haven't said that. So Are you willing to identify the person? No, I don't release my sources. So you but you will act on the on the advice of anonymous people in the House and... and they're not anonymous. I know the person. I've dealt with them before and they trust me. So you released the email but not the name of the person? That's right, I released it. Yeah. It is what? hearsay though, isn't it? Um, well, look, I've relied on the person to read. They're in the meeting. Have you checked to see whether Standard & Poor's confirmed it? No. So this, this person that wrote the email clearly is politically motivated, given the tenor of how he wrote it. Well, the person was at the meeting. You know, I simply got the email, thought it was rather interesting, rang the person up. I've dealt with them before. They they invited me, you they've given me information it. before, which has been correct. He invited you to use it, which was obviously an invitation. Well, obviously because, obviously because they was confident what he was saying was correct. But he, I'm he not could... saying it's not. I, I, I wasn't at the meeting, but all I'm telling you, it's not a random comment I made up. I received the email, I verified it with the person. 
So do, do you draw a distinction between what SNP said and what this man <coughs> took them to mean? Well, there's a say I wasn't in the meeting, so... I didn't. No, but do you draw a distinction between those two things? One being uh, what they said and one something that someone inferred? Well, all I can tell you is that the information I received in the conversation I had with the person to tell you with what I said in the house. It doesn't tell, does it? Because an inference isn't a quote. Well, I mean, you're in the house, you were talking about standard and pause, basically telling you. No, I didn't say that. Well, that, that was the inference you could take from what was said in the house. Let's not get into inferences. Yeah. Um, what I said was quite clear. I'll read it to you again. So what I'll say the Sandon Pause was giving a meeting in New Zealand, which they did, about a month ago, which they did. What it did say was it was about a 30% chance that we would be downgraded, which they did. That is what happens when one is on negative outlook. It did go on to say though that if there was a change of government, that the downgrade would be much more likely. So you're referring to Sandon Pause, don't you? No, I'm not saying that. It did say. No, I said that's what they said. Well, the, the, email, the, email. the email also yeah. says that interest rates are likely to go up when we get downgraded, and we weren't. Correct. And that was what Phil Goff said. So, well, Phil that, Goff. that was the that's the conventional wisdom. That's why the rating agencies would think that. So you're now saying you weren't quoting S P. You were quoting the source. Well, I was quoting, but the, the source was telling me what S P said. But the, the, the answer in the house is no. No one's interpreted that way. They interpreted that you were quoting S P. No, I didn't say I was at the meeting. I said there was a meeting that S and P was at. This is exactly what the email says. So when you say they, who else would 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 it well, be? Well, they was the that told me. As I said, I wasn't at the meeting. I never said I was at the meeting with S and P. But surely, regardless of what this, your um, your source says, S and P may not have said that because they've they've said today. They, they may not. But all I'm telling you is, I received an email. The email is from the person that's reliable. I rang the person up. And that was what they told me. But, but you, you. Uh, I, I can't confirm that I wasn't at the meeting. But, but you, this person is, is is well known to me. They supplied me information before it's been correct. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, do you admit though that standard standard and pause might not have said that? Well, I can't confirm. I just I wasn't at the meeting. I'm not. You know, it's not for me to say that I wasn't there. Because I'm just giving quite, you the. I'm just relaying the facts as they were relayed. They've, to me. they've been clear that they don't compare parties. It's well, company policy. Okay. Well, I, I wasn't there. I can't confirm that. I'm just relying on what I was I was told. Why didn't you make it explicit in the house that you'd got this information from a source? Well, I mean, I made it clear I wasn't at the meeting. Are you, are you saying, Prime uh, Minister, that when you used the word they in the house, you were referring to your informants, not s &P? Well, that was what the, the person I spoke to. That was what they told me that the S&P said. But when you said in the house, you didn't refer to anyone telling you this. You just said S&P said there was a 30% chance of a downgrade, and they said... Yeah, they being the person that told me. And that's what, what they were told by S&P. Well, except that that's unclear, though, because... Well, if, you read, no, but if you read what you said in the house, I read it as well, and it's quite clear that you were referring to standard informants. Not, well, not, 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 not to a person that informed you. Well, as I said, they held a meeting. That was what took place. The person sent me an email. I rang the person. That's what they told me. When you rang the person, you had received yeah. an email saying the inference was yeah. that it said. And I said right. what they say. And when you rang that person, did you then say, yeah. was that an inference or did they actually say it? Yeah, I said what they say. They said if there's a change of government, there's two thirds chance that they'll be downgraded. Who else was the Did that call SMP to confirm that? No. You said there were six in the email. No, I didn't say the same. Well, was the bank economist there? Well, as I said, that's what it said. I didn't know who was at the meeting. They said it was part of a session with a range of economists yesterday morning. They do this every year with economists from Australia, plus all the main New Zealand banks. Okay, any other questions? Uh, oh, another question. Uh, Lockwood yeah. Smith uh, going to the United States to shore up the trade. <coughs> Who was the government believe that he should have gone? Well, he went for a number of reasons, but obviously with a historical uh, role, um, you know, we thought it would be useful. He was also visiting the Speaker of the House, I think, in a number of other meetings he's had over there. We thought it was useful given his time. Uh, he's not on the, it's probably more appropriate for him to campaign given his Speaker. Uh, so it seems a use, use, good use of his time. Isn't the Speaker supposed to be politically neutral? 
Well, I think he's trying to advance the cause for New Zealand. The last time I saw, you know, that Australia, that both um, Labour and National, you know, seem to be supportive of an FTA with the United States. I call that very neutral. But Labour yeah. has concerns about the TPP. <coughs> Well, uh, you know, he, he's not negotiating the deal, he's just simply putting the case that you know, FTA with the United States could be very useful to New Zealand. Prime Minister, Bomber Bradbury's been banned from Radio New Zealand because he criticised you. What do you think, think of that in terms of a... I didn't hear his comments on the radio and I don't know the name. Do you know whether anyone in your office contacted Radio New Zealand? Well, not to this one, I would be highly surprised if I asked Radio New Zealand to stay over there. Do you think it's a good idea whether or not a person gets banned for criticising the Prime Minister from National Radio? That's a matter for Radio New Zealand. Mm -hmm. been out there. Can I ask you about Exxon? Um, yeah. Have you actually sort of... We talked to you previously about the strategy around Exxon with um, Robin Hyde standing. Is that still the same now? Well, National's position is that we'll be primarily going for the party vote in Epsom. Um, the last couple of elections, what's ultimately happened is that Tactically, uh, there's been a uh, view from Epsom voters uh, of a national persuasion to give their party vote to national and to give their electorate vote to act. Um, I don't know what will happen in 2011. I guess, you know, like a lot of people, they'll take a look at what the situation is on the day and, and make a call. So you're saying you want national voters <coughs> in Epsom uh, and the electorate vote to vote for John Banks? That's what you're telling them to No, I haven't said that. What I've said is our primary, exactly our, our primary vote is the party vote, and the decision on who they give their electorate vote to is a matter for those voters. So you're not, as the National Party Prime Minister, urging them to vote for Paul Goldson? Uh, what I'm t saying to them is I'm urging all national voters in Epsom to give their party vote to National. What they do with their electorate vote is a matter for them. Why don't you want them to vote for Paul Goldsmith as well? Two ticks national, because that's a campaign you're running for. Yeah, um, well our primary vote right around the whole country is actually for um, a party vote, uh, tactically uh, some national voters in 2005 and 2008 did vote for ACT and that was um, for obvious reasons that they were under 5% but of a significant enough margin to make a difference. It was obvious that they wanted to work with national. Um, that's the same position ACT has today that made it clear that they would work with a national government. How do you, is, is you characterise your um, view of Don Brash as a member of your cabinet or as a minister in your government? Would you say enthusiastic or accepting? What word would you use? But I think we're, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves and we've got a general election to have on November 26 and then he has indicated that he wants to work uh, with National if he's in a position to do so, but he hasn't given an indication of, of how, how that might be. I mean, it's a, it's a support for confidence and supply, but as we've seen since we've had him in 1996, that can take a variety of forms. Do you think you say you're comfortable people? with that idea? Oh, I, am I comfortable working with him? Would you be comfortable with having him in your cabinet or in your ministry? Oh, I mean, that, that, that would be for another day. I mean, the, the first point, let's just see what actually happens post the election. I mean, there's obviously a range of options there, and one of those would be that they simply offer confidence and supply and everything else sort of case by case. You've happily ruled out people prior to elections in the past, Roger Douglas and yeah. Winston Peters. You're not going to that no. extent. Is that, is that advice on Epsom set in stone, or do you, would you review that advice in the light of any... Um, do the polling, for instance? That's, like, you know, that's likely to be our position. You know, primary vote is the party vote, and we'll see what happens from there. Is that the only electorate that that's the case? Uh, I mean, our primary vote is the party vote right across the country. But you're not saying that to voters in Ohio, for example? Uh, as I say, the primary vote, um, in our case, is the party vote. That's also true in Ohio, but it's true actually everywhere. It's true in Helensville. Will you, you campaign Mr about... Goldsmith and Epson? Sorry? Will you campaign Mr Goldsmith? I'll already have, and I'm sure I'll do more in the future. Are you concerned at all about how it looks where effectively you're offering a pipeline <coughs> where, you know, when the party has basically torn itself asunder in the, in the past term? I'm not sure it's quite as cl clear cut as that. I mean, I think the situation is that uh, in 2008, and I think it's also true in 2005, the primarily national voters of Epsom um, decided to at least a significant majority of them to give the electorate vote to uh, the ACT candidate. You know, that case will be high. Um, that may well be the case in 2011 with the ACT candidate being John Banks, but it will be a matter for them. I think at the end of the day they'll, they'll take their own lead on you know, I guess what they think on the day, what they think of the person and what they think of the makeup of the parliament could or should be. That I seems. Like, I mean, on the face muster, of it, the forecast for the prison muster um, as high as they have been, they're falling back. Yes. Is there still a need for a new prison specifically at Wirree? I mean, that's something that the government will need to consider um, in due course. I mean, we're obviously pleased by the the, the um, falling numbers of prison inmates, 
uh, I think that's a, a, a great result on, uh, and a reflection on some of the government policies that we've had. Um, in the end, you know, we'll make that call you know, when we finally look at that. It may possibly be that Wurri would be still built uh, on the basis that some other older prisons could be retired, so it's not clear cut, we'll need to consider that. So there's a possibility that you would reconsider and decide not to go ahead? Well, it's, it's possible, but as I say, you know, certainly one school of thought is that um, they would retire some older prisons, there's some very old ones. Prime Minister, what was it like uh, in the fan zone in Christchurch last night when the earthquake, um, when the earthquake struck? Yeah, so it made a very loud noise. In fact, the noise slightly before the, um, before you felt the shaking. Uh, similar to when I've been there before and we've had the earthquakes. I mean, it, it was sort of a rolling sensation of motion as opposed to a very scary single jolt. People were very calm, actually, I've got to say. Um, everyone noticed it, crowd went quiet for you know, a few moments and then people sort of focused back on, on the game. I saw people checking their phones, obviously, and suspect checking loved ones at home. Um, at half time, um, the MC that was here, Simon Barney, got up and, and gave a bit of an update of you know, the size of the earthquake, where the epicentre was in, in Dunham Harbour, etc. Isn't that the argument for reinsurance? Or it, it probably supports the view that the, that the government's been putting up, which is there is ongoing seismic activity there, and until that actually stabilises, it becomes difficult to really mobilise the rebuilding effort. Um, but we can use that time to do what we are doing, which is extensive planning and obviously demolition of damaged buildings. Will, will you consider having a, you know, like we did with Rodney Hyde and Epson before, will you consider having a sort of photo opportunity and a coffee with John Bax in that last week of the election? It's possible. Will you consider it? It's possible we haven't made that decision yet. Just John Bax? Um, it's possible we've made that decision. The interim <coughs> report on the, uh, from the Royal Commission around the, uh, the quote, <coughs> would you anticipate um, some changes, uh, say, before the election coming through, particularly, I mean, I guess that ties in with the reinsurance issue, doesn't it, to try and um, yeah. build some confidence down there? Well, I honestly don't know what's in the interim report. I simply haven't seen it, so I hate to prejudge it. Um, you know, when we have an opportunity to see the report, then that would indicate you know, what the likely government response is and under what timetable. So when we get that, we'll, we'll let you know by Wednesday, try and at least give you a problem on the review. Yeah, I mean, how close were we sort of to, to getting insurance back? I mean, has this, has this pushed that back even further? Uh, might slightly delay things. I mean, it's, it was a 5.5, I was done, Sam, this has been, the vote rate has been changed because of what it told us last night. Uh, so it, it doesn't help the situation. You know, when you've got these reasonable shocks, that tends to push things back. Um, Bob Parker said to me last night that it was one of the newer faults, so I'm not sure if that's right or not. And there's better information that we need to check with him. Prime Minister, Pushing since, back since by, you're... Mark, by sort of days, weeks or months? What, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't speculate on that. I mean, we're obviously continuing to work with the insurance company and we're providing them the best information that we can. And as I say, the pleasing thing prior to all this point, because I understand there was a bit of seismic activity around that fault on the Saturday as well, was that prior to that, the decay curse had been looking better and the seismic activity <coughs> was calming down. So I'm, I'm just simply not sure what's causing that. <laughs> just going back to the, the arena, are you satisfied that everything has been done um, as rapidly and the response has been as, as sharp as it could have been? Yes, and, uh, and look, it, as I've said on a couple of occasions the last 24 hours, you know, I've been involved now in everything from the Christchurch earthquakes to the Pike River mine disasters. And what I can tell you is being intimately involved in those things, they look a lot less complex when you look from the outside looking in. But when you actually get involved, these are really complex. I mean, big ships like this just don't hit reefs, uh, reefs like that every five seconds, obviously. Um, you know, they, they are computer modelling this thing in, in London. They're trying to work out exactly what happens and what the likelihood of it breaking up. Um, you know, there's a lot of work going on, and it's just not as simple. I mean, getting the oil off the ship is not easy. Uh, you have to heat the oil up. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different parts to this. It's just not as simple as saying, you know, we just move the thing on. Unfortunately, you know, something terribly um, terrible has gone on here and we just need to sort that out. And yes. if there is a disaster and the worst happens and all that oil washes up on the beach, are there more people you can mobilise or do you have enough there now to deal with that cleanup? <coughs> well, obviously you'd have to assess that, but I mean, the, the, the team that are there, which is quite an extensive team, are, are confident they have enough people. My understanding was up to 500 defence people that could help. I'm sure the locals would mobilise as well. Um, I think it's important. I mean, I did ask the question what happens if the ship breaks up. The seals that they have there, they can apply um, to, because they get quite a lot of water in there, um, they can apply to the, to the um, tanks. And, and even if it did sink, it's very unlikely that the oil would actually necessarily leach from that. In fact, it would be self-contained. So they seem you know, as confident as they can be, but as I say, everything's bespoke and not necessarily seen before. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah.